yeah, the best thing about being younger is you can cold email pretty much anybody or you can get in t- contact with pretty much anybody um, if you want to. Uh, you can use your, your youth as an advantage because people are always willing to help out younger people. Hey guys, welcome to the Up Next podcast where we are interviewing teen entrepreneurs that are making it big time in the startup world. We are asking the questions we know you want to hear. Up Next is an app made for teens where anyone can join or build a real life startup. So today we have John McKenno, right? Almost, uh, Macalhoun, almost. Macalhoun, age 20 from Northern Ireland. The company that John has founded is called CropSafe, and their aim is to bring affordable, reliable, and accessible crop analytics um, and prediction models to farmers across the world. Simplifying the complex by providing you with alerts that allow you to quickly get answers when you need them most. This company was founded two years ago, meaning John was 18. Um, sounds really original. Like I've never heard anything like it. Super cool. John, is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, just appreciate you having me on and, and happy to share any thoughts. Very happy to have you. And I'm sure that all the young entrepreneurs out there are waiting to hear your words of wisdom. So you have found yourself with an active venture and success in many forms. How did you find out that what you're working on has a high demand? I guess it's, it's more about talking to um, customers other than yourself. So usually when, when you start building a product, it's, it's for yourself. Um, so I think the next step is really talking to other people that are similar to you and have similar problems to you. And just talk to as many as, uh, as you can. If, if they say they'd love to use a product like, like that, uh, just why not go ahead and build it? And that, that's really how CropSafe started. We talked to more farmers and said, yeah, I would use this. And so that's, that's, that's to be your, your first step. And how did you get to the whole farmer's aspect? Like, because I'm guessing you're not a farmer. No, yeah, I, I came from a farming background. Um, so pretty much in, in Ireland, every single person is some sort of farmer or your neighbors are farmer your parents are farmers and so yeah yeah ireland looks beautiful with all that green so that makes sense there's a bunch of farmers. a lot of rain too yeah um so who would you consider your first mentor and what did they help you through um i would say um probably had a a few first mentors and so it's not really like one main person that kind of helped us through everything i think it's more of of like a um, an aggregation of talking to a few previous founders that have built companies. Um, it's probably the most helpful. And I think one of the most helpful first things is actually helping you get that first prototype out into the market uh, as soon as possible. A lot of people spend months and months building out this very first version of the product. But I think the most helpful feedback we got when we first built out uh, the first version of CropSafe was build it in a week and then test it. Even if it's terrible, it's, it, it's good to test it as quick as possible and then iterate based on that rather than spending a whole year on development and realizing your customers don't need what you've just built. Yeah, totally. Getting that feedback is the greatest way to move it forward. So you did answer, half answered, I'm guessing, the next question, which is how much time did it take you to build the product that you launched? Uh, Well, well, to be honest, our first version of the product did take some time. So it did take a few months. And that's when we realized that was a bit of a mistake because we realized that some farmers didn't like what we just built. Um, but after realizing that, um, our next step was to kind of make a new iteration based off of this feedback and the next iteration only took a week. And that's something we've built into the process of CropSafe right now. When we build out new features, we only build them out very basic. We don't spend a lot of time on it. We test it first and then we realize, okay, the customer does want this, they don't want this, and then move on from there. So I think that's something very important, whether you're building a hardware prototype or a software prototype, you should spend as little time as possible building the very basic one feature and roll it out to customers as quick as possible and, uh, and focus on that. Yeah, that's very true. I really agree. I'm happy that you're actually talking about the whole customer feedback thing. It's something really realistic that a lot of people forget to take into their equation when building something. They think that like, oh, I got it and this is the thing and everyone's going to love it, but that might not be yeah. the case at first. Um, so how did you pay for the production of the first version that you launched? Did you get investments? Was it your own money? Well, to be honest, the first version of our product didn't cost anything at all. Um, so 
I'm a big believer in not spend an awful lot on the first version of your product, or even in the first few months of your startup, you don't need to spend any money at all, like a budget of no more than $100. Um, for either software or hardware is more than enough to actually get domain name, get some hosted and get something up. Um, so yeah, I don't think we spent anything. We just used like a free domain service, a free hosting service, and just got something up really quick. Like pretty much, you can get pretty much anything on the internet for free right now. So there's no need to like uh, wonder if you need ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars to to build your first product, because uh, ninety nine point nine percent of all product projects or, or startups don't need any money to build that first iteration. That that's only the, the, the first thing you need. Yeah, I think part of being an entrepreneur is finding the creative way to do that sort of thing, not to like right away throw money at the problem. And, you know, there's, there are other ways, especially in today's, you know, day and age. Um, so as we know, your audience is farmers around the world, I'm guessing. How did you get those first users and customers? What was it like? Well, the first users mainly came from uh, connections uh, already in the community because uh, I kind of grew up in the in the area. It's it's, it's not too difficult to, to find them. Um, but then further on, the, the, our our waiting list kind of uh, grew organically. That's one thing I find that if you can build something that's that's radically different from um, other solutions or uh, and solves a, a problem quite uh, quite um, directly, um, usually organic growth will follow. Um, it's, it's not like a long-term scalable um, distribution model, but at least it'll work for your first iteration. Maybe your first year or so, uh, organic growth will drive enough users to your product um, while you test it and iterate on it. So, so that's mainly how we got our, our first users, just talking to people, talking to as many farmers as possible, asking them if they can refer a friend, and uh, that's pretty much it. That's great. A lot of platforms that are ear to mouth, they have this unique thing to them because you don't need the ads you don't need the um notifying you know a bunch of people because someone will like the idea and they'll tell the idea to someone else and it's kind of a Absolutely. snowball effect so i think that shows real success um what is the next goal that you're aiming for whether it's with crop safe or in general yeah we're, we're taking a, a strong push towards the u.s market right now and um, so a lot of high value farmers are, are based in the u.s and we've been mainly focused on Europe, UK, uh, Ireland, and Ireland, a uh, focus in the past year or so. Uh, but we're finding uh, we need to make that push towards the US market. So that's, that's uh, the aim for the next three months or so. Uh, we've got an aim to roll out to 15 US states, and we're hoping to kind of finish that rollout in the next three weeks, and then spend the remaining months uh, trying with those customers, getting feedback with from them, running focus groups, and, and figuring out uh, as much information as possible from them uh, before we scale out um, later into this year. Yeah, that is a, that's a big step. It is a huge area of the U.S. market. They have a bunch of farms themselves. Um, so if you could talk to your past self, just starting out, what mistake did you make that you would warn your future self? Um, I, I would say number one is never doubt yourself in a way. Um, so when we're younger, we tend to put these barriers up for ourselves and say, hey, um, I can't make this next step of starting a product because I don't know how to program or I don't know how to design. I, I don't know how to raise money. I don't know how to um, build a, a marketing channel. Um, and we always kind of create these in, invisible walls for ourselves. And what I find over time is these walls are, are in a way kind of invisible. They're, they're mental barriers rather than actual barriers that are limiting yourself because pretty much all of this thing all of these uh, barriers are, are are solvable through like a simple google search you can google uh how do i uh, learn to code or how do i learn to design or how do i learn to build a marketing funnel and as soon as i kind of took that on board for myself we started moving a lot a lot quicker in, in product iteration and getting things out to customers like you can figure out pretty much everything you need to know um if you have an internet connected device and pretty much everybody watching this video uh does so yeah. Just Google anything you're not sure of. Get out of your head and try Absolutely. it out. Yeah, check your options. Um, so you are the founder of CropSafe. Do you have a co-founder? Yes, I have a co-founder who's, who's awesome. His name's uh, Michal. He grew up with me about, uh, we've known each other for about 10 years or so. He also grew up on farms, so he takes our, our customer focus. 
Oh, that's great that you guys both have the, the traits that you need, you know, to build the platform even better. So what are three traits that you look for in a business partner or co-founder? Um, I think the number one, um, also applicable to like first hires when you hire us within a startup or project is always that self drive. Uh, you want somebody that um, you don't have to kind of always be behind them, pushing them to the, like, the next step or, or, or the next uh, objective. You want somebody that's already running the, running the course and uh, know, knows the right direction uh, of where to go. So I think n number one is definitely a strong drive of, of your vision uh, of what you're building and, um, and, and they love what they do pretty much. So I think, I think that, that thing is very easy to spot, especially when, when interviewing different um, ap applicants um, to hire actually is within like the first 10, 20 seconds, you can usually tell if somebody's really passionate about what they're doing. And I think that's something that's absolutely required. If, if you can't make a, a hard yes decision within 20 to 30 seconds, and you look at that person right or not a good for hire or a potential co-founder. Um, yeah, those are, those are traits that I'm sure you have in the co-founder that you work with as well. Um, so being so young, um, could you tell me one advantage and one disadvantage being in the industry? Um, I would say probably the biggest advantage is everybody is more than willing to give young people a chance. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, yeah, the best thing about being younger is you can cold email pretty much anybody, or you can get in contact with pretty much anybody, um, if you want to. Uh, you can use your, your youth as an advantage because people are always willing to help out younger people. Uh, we find, like I've never been turned down for an intro. I've never been turned down um, asking somebody for advice. And, uh, and I think you should, if you have that youth, take full advantage of it. People are kind of scared to, to, to use that, um, but I say go, take full advantage for it. But in terms of disadvantages, I haven't really thought too much about that, but I think... Um, with our youth, a lot of people, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, put up those barriers for themselves because they, they think, hey, I'm too young. I can't build the next billion dollar company or, hey, I'm too young. I, um, I haven't had enough time to learn how to code yet. So I think younger people tend to put up those barriers more often. And that's something we need to focus on removing uh, as much as possible because it's just a mental barrier. It's not like anything we can't do. It's always, always solvable. Yeah, anything really is. It, and there's no doubt that it's always more impressive right off the bat when whatever you're doing, you're doing at a young age. So I always find that as more of an advantage than anything. Um, so making this platform and everything that has to do with it, what did you find as a tech tool that you can't go without? Something that you really you need on a daily basis? Um. We build software products, so I say the best tool we use, like we use from day one, we still use it, is the platform called Bubble.io. Um, and what Bubble actually, lets you do is create. We actually work with them, so I'm so happy <laughs> that you said yeah. that they are the best. Yes, it, it's brilliant. You can pretty much, it, it's, it's basically a, a no code or low code um, software development platform. So you don't need to know how to code to actually build a, um, a development on it. So the way we use it is we, use Bubble to build out first iteration prototypes to share with our customers before we actually ship something in production to them. So we can build something in Bubble in like one or two days, uh, whereas programming, it'll take us a, like maybe a few weeks to get something really solid together. So Bubble is probably something that's, that's extremely valuable to learn because if you have a software product idea and you don't know how to code, you can pretty much ship something in, in less than a week to customers. Yeah, like as we said, one of those barriers that you have in your head one of them is checked off and taken care of because you don't need to know how to start programming. Um, exactly. So which entrepreneurs inspire you the most these days? Who do you have your eye on? Uh, um, I, I would say there's, 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 there's quite a few people. I think um, everybody always says like Elon Musk and, yes, and Mark Zuckerberg, right. but no, I, yeah, I, th I, th I think those guys are great as well, but um, even like the, the likes of like Jack Dorsey um, is pretty interesting. Um, I, th I think one thing actually about 
super successful entrepreneurs um, or, or business people is, is one thing I notice is they're always like that ever so slightly a uh, bit strange or slight people would think they're slightly weird. That's so um, Which is, I think y younger entrepreneur are afraid of being a bit weird or a bit seem to come off a bit, bit crazy. But I, th yeah. I think that's okay. Cause usually the most successful entrepreneurs are the people that are crazy and the people that will take that extra step that the hundred thousand other people won't take. Um, so even for entrepreneurs, I think we should learn from these more successful people like Elon Musk, uh, Jack Dorsey, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill yeah. Gates, whoever it may be. And they're all slightly, slightly different, slightly weird in their own way. And, and I think we should all be uh, kind of accept um, that we might be as well. And we shouldn't hide the fact that things about us are different and uh, just be okay with Got stuck there for a second. Give it a minute. Oh, there you go. You were frozen there for a second. But I was about to um, to say they really are, you know, they are, they have this strange kind of way to them, but in a really good way. It's like their head's already in the future and they're they're already envisioning the next thing, like their mind is always working. So if you're that kind of, you know, weird, let's call it weird, I would embrace it to Absolutely. the maximum. Um, so which trait do you feel is your weakest trait and you need to outsource it maybe from a person or some kind of tech platform? Um, I would say, that's a difficult question. Um, I, I would say probably um, I'm st I'm still figuring out time management. <laughs> um, even, even though some people say say I'm good at it, I think there's always ways we can kind of improve um, our own time management because uh, that's that's another thing about those buyers I, I was mentioning. Um, sometimes when people tell me about their business idea they they want to start, um, I ask them why they haven't they started it right now and um the number one answer everybody always gives is, is they don't have enough time um i think that's always kind of a an avoiding um yeah there's never excuse really time. because yeah exactly if, if you have facebook if you have instagram if you have snapchat or, or tiktok on your phone you have enough time to build a startup or build a solution to to, to one of your problems so yeah i i still need to improve on time management um even though i'm pretty efficient but i still need i still have a lot a lot of way to go well, there's always things that we can cut off and sometimes we just kind of deny it and choose not to. But, you know, we're, we're human, so we should let ourselves sometimes. Yes. Um, <laughs> so at the beginning of our interview, we talked about how much um, money you invested into the first launch. And you said that you really shouldn't invest that much money. It could be as little as $100, which brings me to the next question. Let's say that I'm an average teenager looking to build my startup and all I have is $100. What, where, or how would you tell me to invest this money in? Um, I would say try not to spend any of that $100 and think of that $100 as more as a, an emergency fund for your startup uh, in a way. Um, so, for example, if you're building, say, uh, say a software SaaS platform, mm -hmm. um, you'd start to build your software on the, the free version of Bubble, and then you'd use um, a free domain name, you would connect to it, uh, and then maybe um, one of your customers that you're trialing with is, is a bit hesitant about using the platform because it's not SSL secured by like a fancy domain or name or something. So you can spend maybe $10 on getting a new domain name. So, yeah, think of that first kind of float budget. Uh, more as an emergency fund you don't really need to use it um, just use it if it's limiting you to push into your next factor um so like try to keep as uh, as lean budget as possible hundred dollars is more than enough um to, to test out the first prototype yeah it really is it should um i mean from what you're saying we can like not touch the money at all and still have something functioning right. and like a first mvp thing going on um so we got two bonus questions. Uh, your platform is really extraordinary in my opinion. It's something that is really helping an audience that I don't think a lot of people even thought to themselves that they need 
assistance in any way. So how important is it uh, for young entrepreneurs to think about social change when creating a business? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's important for the younger generation in particular to, to drive that themselves. Um, we've seen technology has been uh, around and the internet has been around for, uh, for, for decades now. Um, but our generation is kind of the first generation that's grown up with the internet, grown up with these new technologies. And it's really just up to us to kind of make that social change because if it's not us, it's going to be the next generation or the next generation. Uh, so, so why not kind of uh, from, from the get go, go ahead and kind of take a stab at, at fixing that uh, problem that, that, that you see? Yeah, a lot of a lot of the generations now are like we're fixing what our parents ruined yeah. and stuff like that. So it really is a generation that grew up knowing that there has always been Internet, like there wasn't really a time where there wasn't. So we really need to use it to our advantage and not only make people a product. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, in all seriousness, last question a little more um, light, let's call it. So if you could have any superpower in the world, what would you pick? Oh, uh, prob probably one to, to create a boss would probably uh, the ability to uh, read minds or manipulate minds in a way. <laughs> but not a bit, like for a bit strange, but no, imagine, imagine if you could, yeah. <laughs> if, Wait, just so I persuade people to, to do anything, but that's, that's probably like a an even villain origin story. But I think it's pretty yeah. cool. That's what I'm saying. Like it seems nice to well, nice. It seems easy and available for us to manipulate people but yeah it is a slippery slope and it can get we can start you know using it to only our advantage but i trust you to not you know take over the world or something so i'll let you have it yeah. um okay so john it was great getting to know you and i think this platform is one of the most you know original ones that i've read about i think it's super cool and i can't wait to Appreciate see it. what you do next I hope we can have you again sometime. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me. I really, really enjoyed this. Happy to.